How does a company like Slack manage to send millions of messages from users all around the world within a day? I mean, there must be some powerful architecture in their backend to be able to distribute those messages so reliably. Well, worry not, that's exactly what we're gonna dig deep into this video to better understand how they make use of concepts like consistent hashing, server proxies, broadcasting, and so on. And since we're gonna be talking a lot about messaging in this video, I wanna give a quick shout out to Zigo Cloud. Zigo Cloud is a global communication service provider who provides a developer-friendly and powerful SDK with APIs that let you build features such as video calls, chats, video conferences, live streaming, and much more. But that's not all. Zico Cloud also offers a ready-made visual plug-and-play component called UIKit that can help you build your app in shortest time possible. One-on-one -on -one calls, group calls, live order rooms, in-app chats, all of that is possible with Zico Cloud. You can also add and remove components based on your specific business needs. For example, do you need dynamic video layouts in your React Native app? Then you can simply add this component. Do you want to have in-room messages, maybe face beautification? We've got all of that too. Zigo Cloud offers a bunch of solutions that are needed in every modern app. That's why go to Zigo Cloud by following the link in the description to get 10,000 free minutes of usage right after creating an account, create your first project, Choose a use case for your app. For example, in my case, I want simply video and video calls. Then click next and here you'll be able to name your project. Then choose UI kits. Then of course, choose the platform that you want to build upon and you're ready to go and you can customize your screen as you'd like. Thanks so much to Zigo Cloud and now back to the video. All right, friends. So let's try to understand Slack's backend by actually looking from the user's perspective first. So Slack has these channels and it can also has direct messages. So what's interesting is that in the backend, they refer to channels as not only this kind of channels, but a subset of channels. So this is one channel, maybe a single channel is also a channel and direct messages or even a subset of direct messages can also be a channel. Now, these channels are mapped to a specific channel server. Now, as I said in the beginning of the video, chat is a very large company and it manages literally millions of active users every day. So what happens is one of these servers goes down. Now we might lose this mapping. That's why we don't want that. And we need to use some kind of a different algorithm. We need to use something called consistent hashing. Now consistent hashing is literally everywhere in distributed systems. It can be even in Cassandra databases. It can be in AWS DynamoDB. The reason is if you're storing one data, a lot of data, in one database, this is very risky. That's why people usually spread this data across multiple instances of this database across different data centers. But to remember where your data has been saved, that's why you need consistent hashing for this hash to point to a specific database. Now we're gonna come back to this, but I also wanna point out that Slack has built its own server called Charms, which stands for Consistent Hash Ring Managers, which actually directly operates this hashing algorithm, okay? Now let's talk about consistent hashing itself. It's a pretty interesting topic. So let's say we have a channel, which can be a direct message as we saw here, okay? This is a subset of direct messages and it has to be saved in one of the servers. Now there's probably some kind of a database which saves this mapping. So it says channel one is mapped to server one. Now, how is this server one hashing is computed? Well, it's computed like this. So server to point to, let's say channel is looking for a server, server to point to, let's say the user refreshed the page, and now we need to know which server this has been pointed to. Well, we're gonna take the ID of the channel, and we're also going to use a modulus and by the number of servers. So let's say we have three servers now, and every time the user refreshes the page, we know that we have the same ID of the channel and the number of the server, and now this channel is mapped here, so we fetch our data. But what happens if one of the servers goes down? Not even the one where our data is saved. Let's say this blue one goes down, so we no longer have three services, we only have two servers here, okay? Now, due to the different modulus that we're going to use our number against, our hash that has been produced here is going to be completely different. And now this channel no longer knows which server its data lives on because the hash has completely changed. That's why engineers came up with another formula for consistent hashing. Now in this formula, we're no longer depending on the channel ID, but we're also depending 
on the channel name, all right? And then how many servers we have in place. Okay, so in this case, it's not going to be this kind of a hierarchy, but it's going to be a ring. So in a ring, let's say we have one channel service and we have one channel and then channel two and then third channel, and it's going to go clockwise, meaning this channel is always going to be bound to this server this channel is always going to be bound to this one and this one is going to be bound to channel server 2. Now the thing here is if one of the servers goes down let's say third one as it did previously and now we have only two servers it doesn't really affect the hashing algorithm because now this server or this channel that's try that used to be bound to channel server three is simply going to go over it and now hit the channel server one. And as you can see, the channel server two wasn't really affected, so it's much more reliable. Now that you know about consistent hashing, let's explore different parts of the Slack backend. Now we have service discovery. Well, in distributed systems, you have so many microservices that literally are spun up and spun down or deleted every minute because some of them can become unhealthy. That's why something needs to keep track of those services that are alive and that are dead. That's why we have a central repository or a database, if you want to call it, that's actually aware of every channel server and every charm that is running in Slack's backend. Now, what happens when a user actually sends a message? So let's say you open Slack and the page loads. What happens now? So while the page is loading, the client is actually going to make a request to the server. Here, we're going to fetch the user state. For example, your name, your surname, the company that you're working for. At the same time, the client or your browser is going to establish a WebSocket connection with one of the gateway servers. Now, what is a gateway server? A gateway server is basically an edge server that is distributed around the world. So if you're working from Asia, your gateway server is going also to be in Asia. If you're working from the US, your gateway server is not going to contact the one in the Asia, but the one in the US. That's why Slack is able to load the messages so fast. But there's also one other component that lives together with every gateway server, or maybe just two of them, like a subset of them, Envoy. What is an Envoy? Well, you already know Nginx, which is a proxy server, which is very good at serving static files and can actually also work as a proxy server handle TLS connections and so on. I have a video on that if you want to learn more about it. But Envoy, let's say, is a more sophisticated way because it's also called an edge proxy. So it's an edge proxy and it works well with cloud native applications. It has more capabilities than Nginx and it has even more configurations that you can configure. So usually big microservices backends usually use Envoy and it also works well with CDN. So you can have Envoy or different gateway servers that are running at the in different locations in the world. So now we know that Envoy is deployed in front of our gateway servers and the gateway server establishes a WebSocket with a connection. What is it gonna do? First of all, the gateway server, let me change the color, is going to read the channel configurations from the service discovery because as you remember, service discovery still knows where every channel server is located and all of these mappings, all right? So let's say we fetch the user channel servers from here and service discovery says that this user needs channel IDs one, two, and three. And now this gateway server is also subscribed to those channel servers. Now, at the same time, the gateway server gets the data for those channels that it found out from the service discovery, let's say one, two, three, and then it fetches the data or messages that has been sent in channel one to three. So there's a little bit delay and then the web, web socket sends the data back to the client. Now, as soon as a, a different user, let's say this user sends a, sends a message through a web socket, someone from your company, it lands on one of the channel service that we are subscribed to, let's say it was the third one, it's automatically going to push a notification to the gateway servers that have been subscribed to it. And the gateway server is going to push this message to us in the WebSocket. So it's kind of a event driven architecture that's living between the channel servers and that looks very messy and the gateway servers that we have. I hope this was insightful friends. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comments. If you have any topic requests, also let me down in the comments. And if you don't want to miss this kind of videos, make sure to subscribe and like the video and I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.